Hi everybody, I'm Suzanne Aldrich. I'm with uh, Customer Success Agent at Get Pantheon, and I would like to uh, have a talk here about how we like to have a perfect launch every time, all the kinds of tools and resources and uh, techniques that we're using to try to get it so that people, when they launch their website, um, have a great experience for all the users and for them as developers and for stakeholders. And so um, let's go ahead and define what is a perfect launch? Well, in, in software development, you're going for uh, trying to minimize the amount of time that it takes. You want something to come out on schedule, so you want to have good project management. Um, as far as cost, being on budget, you know, that's also part of this, this uh, minimization triangle. And scope, on plan. In other words, you've, you've actually achieved the features that are supposed to happen for this website, and the end user is going to be satisfied. So how do we reach this uh, magical paradise of a perfect launch where all these have been maximized and you have rainbows and unicorns? And we're going we're gonna to go ahead and talk about that today. And why should you care? Because um, you could end up in a situation where um, you'll see here we have a site that is going along nicely and maybe it has deployed a bad piece of configuration, has a single error, a single bad configuration where it's not talking to the backend cache and nobody tested this, and they just went and deployed it to live, to production. And the purpose of this talk um, is also to try to encourage people for um, reaching towards the aim of continuous delivery, where we you know, test before we deploy. So no mo YOLO is kind of like one of the things that we kind of want to encourage here. No mo YOLO. <laughs> So a perfect launch recipe, we have onboarding, we have launch team, and we have uh, a launch check to check for configuration, and we have a load test for performance tuning. And these three things together are essentially what it takes to um, enable a site to get to the point of launching, not having terrible errors that are causing performance problems, and um, able to see any kind of bad configuration before deploying it. So let me describe first the very first part of the launch team's success, which is onboarding. And this is where we get everybody um, to, to realize we want to get rid of all the uh-oh moments in web development. Uh-oh moments are things like, I forgot that we were on um, this schedule and I deployed this one thing over here, and um, now I don't know how to merge this back into the master uh, flow for the bug fix, or things like that. So the idea is that you, you, you set out um, all the scope, you map the terrain, and you get all the stakeholders involved so they understand how the launch is going to go forward and everybody is um, on a calendar and kind of has an idea of the path that we're going to be traveling down together because it's an adventure. Um, we have people that you need to get involved in this process like the project manager. Uh, they under need to understand about you know, scheduling best practices. You have the developer, they're going to need to be um, familiarized with the, the platform in particular, the environment that they're deploying on, and integration points. You're going to have systems um, administrators who are going to have to also know specific uh, their responsibilities and um, what things they're, they're specifically responsible for in the launch. And as far as the business owner, their main concern, of course, is a flawless launch. They want to have um, a faster website where more users can buy their products. So uh, for the onboarding uh, team, we have a system and tools, and we want to share some of our, our system and tools with you so that you can kind of replicate this with your project uh, management teams. We try to specify a common set of workflow requirements that we see in common with all these kinds of launches, and we make a template out of that, and we delegate the tasks. So the idea is you want to find a tool that works for you and your team, whatever kind of current integration um, environment that you have. It's nice if you can have your project management software also tie into that by API if possible. So JIRA can be a great choice. Um, a lot of people are using Redmine. We're using uh, Trello a lot of the time, but we also use Rike specifically because you can make templates out of project tasks and keep copying them and duplicating them for other projects. As far as um, orientation logistics, is, um, to get everybody on the same page, you have to be uh, clear and concise with your calendars. You don't want too many meetings, but you want at least to have everybody understanding what's expected of them and so we can all get on the same page. It's important to have, you know, uh, possibly uh, set up what phone or conference line so that at the point when there's a panic, nobody is having to understand what number I call. Everybody knows when there's an emergency, you dial 911. So you kind of want to have something like that for your client as well, and everybody can um, not panic about the form of communication and just worry about the bug itself. 
And same thing with training. If you have any kind of specific things um, that need to be communicated, it's very important to get these set up ahead of time and have slides, videos, whatever it takes for documenting. And then, um, as you're mapping the train, it, the scoping of responsibilities, it, it tends to reduce all the confusion so people know what they need to do in order to make this launch happen. Um, we've defined emergency procedures, we know the 911 to call, um, and we also have a single channel inbox. So don't divide up your communication into email and tickets and three different things to keep track of. It's just going to make everybody's life more difficult. And staying in touch, having regular stand-ups, that's clearly the way to do uh, continuous deployment the right way um, and being proactive. And in, after we implemented this launch concierge, this onboarding process, just the, the project management aspect of it, getting all the questions answered, um, <clears throat> over here the blue line represents the, um, actually let me start with the red line which is pre-launch concierge. You'll see there are some questions at the beginning, some tickets, four or five tickets, and then it kind of goes down. People are maybe reading docs on their own. And then they start coming up with questions after having read, read some docs. And the tickets are, are jumping up again. And then they're going back and you know digesting information and then having more questions. And this kind of um, leads to a spiky pattern that we don't like to see. You would like to front load all the questions at the beginning. So um, at the post-launch concierge line, you'll see there's a lot of tickets to start off but they're quickly uh, traversing down the slope until everybody knows everything that they need to know and we've moved right along and people are knowing how we're gonna go towards perfect launch day. So the next step that is extremely important for having a perfect launch is making sure that your configuration is good for your site. Um, in, if you have a lot of modules and plugins and, and you've made sure that they are working well together, that's great, but there are a lot of things within Drupal itself that need to be um, attended to in order to achieve very good performance. So we um, utilize an open source project called Site Audit, which does static analysis on um, a Drupal website for best practices. It gives you a very nice report with a date, you know, and you can kind of keep track of, of where the site is as far as passing its checks. And we don't let a site launch without having a green light all the way along. So it's just like a launch check that you would have for uh, a space shuttle that you're going to launch into space. That's, why, that's the way we like to think of it. And this particular tool is also vendor agnostic, so you can use it whatever platform host you're using. <clears throat> this kind of audit, it's, good, it's a static site analysis, so it's not touching any code, it's not doing anything inside your database, it's some queries. It's looking at what your caching settings, how big your code base is, your file size, database structure, uh, what kinds of modules that you have installed, including learning to if you have duplicate modules or missing modules where the table is still involved in the database but the code has been removed. It also um, helps you understand non-standard code structures, which is great for if you're trying to make uh, all of your developers conform to best practices and knowing where they're installing their modules, etc. And um, one of the, some of the more important things are actually views caching, which we'll go into a little bit later, and as well as the status of your watchdog logs. If you've got a ton of errors going to a watchdog, you might want to know about this before you launch. So um, on Pantheon, we've installed this on the dashboard, so you can just click this tab called Status, and we're going to give you um, a rundown of kind of what, what some of these statuses are that you would see if you were to use our platform, but the same report is available. Um, like you can get a nice HTML bootstrap version on your own sites locally or anywhere else. So uh, Drupal caching settings are extremely important for the performance of a website. Anonymous caching is when a person visits the website and hasn't initiated a session, they haven't logged in, and typically a lot of websites have a lot of anonymous visitors. You want to enable anonymous caching so that the back end of your web application doesn't have to regenerate the same thing over and over again. The URL is basically the key for this, and um, basically on, on Pantheon we've also tied this into Varnish, so if your Drupal page cache is on, the Varnish is caching it too. It's respecting the Drupal's headers. Minimum cache lifetime is, a, is another very important thing I want to cover. Um, we have found in our experience almost every site that we've ever seen um, should just have this set to none. There's almost no reason to have the minimum cache lifetime set, and this setting is being removed from Drupal 8. Uh, expiration of cached pages, you need to set them to be 15 minutes or above. Um, usually dynamic sites need to have this adjusted. There's always going to be a balance between performance and the dynamic aspect of your site. So it's important that everybody knows and all the stakeholders are involved with these kinds of settings. It's good to understand the use case of your website. If you're a news organization and you're updating articles, editors might be irritated if they if submit a node and the article has not uh, reflected on the live site. So these are the kinds of things that need to be reviewed and adjusted. 
And also aggregation. Um, it's so important to do that because browsers can't handle more than 20 JSS files, so you should be aggregating them. <clears throat> so uh, with cron, it's very important for the operation of your site. If you don't have cron running, eventually you're going to have a bad day. I can guarantee it. Please make sure that your system cron is running. If you're not using a Drupal uh, core cron, you can use Elijah cron, which gives you more granularity. In any case, um, these kinds of checks ensure that you're having vital system garbage collection and other kinds of batch processes run for your site. Uh, the database, it's very important to have, uh, you know, the right kind of engine. So we don't recommend MyISM because it does entire table level locking and you're not going to be able to write to that table while it's locked. Therefore, use NODB. Um, for extensions, we do checks. If you have duplicates, if you've installed something but not, um, you know, and then disabled it, that sort of thing, it's going to tell you also if you've got bad judgment and some other very poor ideas uh, of modules on your website as well. So views, I want to touch on this a little bit because this is not very well understood and everybody should start talking about this a little bit more. Drupal has a caching system in core, but it's the entire page that's getting cached. If you have views that are dynamic in your website, you're going to want to look at possibly caching the query because you're running the same query over and over again, typically. And in addition, the rendered results that are coming back from this query, you're also probably going to want to cache. And these settings are only accessible from the views interface. You have to follow this long set of uh, steps that we've pointed out here. And once you do that, you can see, is this the kind of view where I'm going to want to cache it for five minutes or less or more? And again, dependent upon the use case for your website. So please look at these. Um, and oh, one, one note though, uh, don't do this if you are um, having an exposed filter. There might be a patch available, but exposed filter and views caching don't really mix that well. Watchdog, you should look at your watchdog. Watchdog is the canary in the coal mine. If you're getting a lot of error messages, it's time to look at your watchdog to tell you why your site is throwing errors. And I'll tell you why it's so important to catch errors for your website. So we have done things like um, tested websites that have good configuration against ones that have bad configuration. And the ones that, um, that we use Apache Bench, it's a dead simple tool to use. There's a lot of um, instructions on how to use it. We sent 10,000 requests to a home page five at a time, warmed the cache, cleared the watchdog, and we did a comparison between a site with a bad config and one PHP notice and a warning in the theme, and a, a well-configured website with no PHP notices or warnings. And the result? Clearly, bad configuration is, is not good for your website's performance. It ended up doubling the response time, and uh, you're not getting as many requests per second. It's taking more time per each request, so this is why you want to make sure that your site is well configured and does not have any is not throwing errors or warnings. Good configuration matters. Um, you're looking at a new relic app server response time for a site prior to fixing their error and then after fixing their error, and it's pretty dramatic. Um, clearly. The people who were suffering through the long um, load times, they probably weren't buying as many products. So you can make a business case to your stakeholders that we need to spend more time uh, making performance optimizations to our websites here. So the third part, and it's really vital because after you know we're getting closer to launch day and you've got all the data and the files, everything that you need on the website to go, we need to start looking at how it actually is going to perform under load. And um, load testing basically helps validate what kind of response times that you can expect under peak load. And there's a few kinds of load tests. You might want to look into it. Smoke tests um, are operations under normal load. So you run those per, you might do this part of your continuous integration. You might uh, try, uh, want to deploy change and you run it through your continuous integration and see what is the performance after deploying this. And that would be like a smoke test. If you're getting to the point where getting, uh, you're wanting to launch, you want to stress tests, you want to push, um, push it beyond its limits to what you could expect uh, past peak load. And a, and a subtype of this is just for short bursts, which is a spike test. And um, capacity load tests are for um, helping planning for growth in the future. So people who should execute load tests are basically the developers. And um, I, I kind of want to hammer on this that we really need to, as um, developers, involve stakeholders more into making the case for why it is that the performance optimization matters because it actually has a monetary influence on what the website can do for the business. As far as tools for load testing, I've mentioned an Apache Bench. Um, there's a lot of documentation about that. It's a very dead simple tool. 
People use Apache JMeter. Um, my criti critique of Apache JMeter is it's a very high learning curve, which is pretty much why we use Load Impact and Load Storm. They're great programs. They let you um, model a, a trip through a website. So you say, this is the website I want to test, and then you click around to the website like you would want a user to, and that's your user scenario. And then you run your user scenario through various um, numbers of simulated browser users, and it tells you how the response times are. Um, you should be load testing at the very beginning to establish a baseline. Um, and then as you uh, get through it, there are other kinds of um, tools that you're going to be wanting to use along the way. For example, you know, Xdebug, WebGrind. Using the Drupal uh, Develop project is also a great way to help figure out um, system problems in, in, within Drupal itself. And also just looking at Syslog and Watchdog. We offer New Relic. Uh, for free for all of our um, people who have sites on Pantheon, so you can easily add New Relic to your site and have a daemon and then watch the performance metrics divided out per Drupal module, per view, and also per specific um, query, that sort of thing. Um, it's very handy to have that visual reminder. And then as you're developing incrementally, pushing specific features, if, uh, you should probably do another load test because you've changed the, the operation of the website. And you would want to perform uh, low tests usually in the live environment. Um, of course, developers can do it locally, but it doesn't really mean much if you're not doing it on a live or test environment with, with parity with that environment. And um, keep in mind that um, there are resource limitations. If you're trying to run Apache Bench from your local laptop, you're going to run into the limitation of your local ISP's bandwidth. They're not going to let you throw that much bandwidth at your website. So that's why we use load testing SaaS services in the cloud. And they can go ahead and throw all these simulated users at your website through whatever kind of tour that you want them to go through. And then at the end, you'll get a result. This page takes this long to load. That page takes that long to load. And then you can kind of start figuring out, well, we need to prioritize performance for this page because this is the one for ordering products. Um, what to expect during and after? Well, um, as you benchmark often, you're going to be gathering data points and you're going to probably want to build up some reports and aggregate them. It's important to be reasonable. If you've got a very complicated website, a complicated web application, expect the load time to be longer and don't expect it to be able to accommodate as many users. Certainly you can throw resources at it, but there are different points where you can bottleneck. Um, if you're having back-end bottlenecks, we often suggest adding Redis caching. That way you can take um, cache operations off of the back-end database and allow the database to handle other queries that are very vital for the business. And these numbers are the things that should be dictating expectations. And um, you can correlate these things with, with Google Analytics as well. So um, as far as caching, um, there are a, a few different kinds of options and there are different places that you can cache. Um, so with PHP, there's opcode caching and there's a few different options. Um, on, on Pantheon, we're using APC and we also have Zend opcache and there's eAccelerator and I'm sure there's others that I'm not aware of. For uh, backend caching, um, a lot of people are using memcached. Uh, another popular option that we're using at Pantheon is Redis. It's a really fast, efficient key value store. MongoDB is well known, and people often use you know, file system or even APC for this. Um, there are some issues sometimes with using APC in high availability situations when you're doing this kind of caching, so be aware of that. <laughs> and as far as front-end caching, this is so important because this is kind of what um, serves a lot of your visitors. If you have Varnish configured in front of your website, then anytime a visitor hits a web page and they're anonymous, they have no session, if that URL matches one that's already been cached, then they are served out of Varnish. It doesn't ever hit your back end, and your back end is now free to handle another request that does have a session or needs some kind of new query or a page that hasn't been cached. And there's also things like Squid. And we also recommend the use of uh, reverse proxy CDNs like Cloudflare. Um, there's also things like CloudFront. Um, there are a lot of tools uh, more and more these days, so it's a very exciting time to be around watching all these caching technologies kind of take root and the best practices take hold. I wanted to show you here and I, uh, what happens when you um, engage Redis. <laughs> uh, here we have what the arrow, the point in time when somebody uh, started taking all of the caching operations off of their database. 
and put them on Redis. And this is the real world Redis. Uh, it's really wonderful to see a website improve its, op its performance this much just by adding a couple of lines of configuration to your settings.php to send the cache uh, to Redis and not to the Drupal database anymore. Um, yeah, so you can see uh, all, almost all the things that went away are cache page, cache field, those things are gone, no longer being handled by the database. Here's an example of a website where I load tested it and I forgot to check the launch check to see if anonymous page caching had been enabled. And after I did this load test, I was like so mad at the developers because I went through the, the trouble of doing this load test. I kind of scolded them a little bit because they know better. Everybody should learn that anonymous page caching is one of the most important things that you can enable on your Drupal site. So if, if you don't have it enabled, you'll end up with um, a site that as more visitors come and visit, the uh, a response time increases directly proportionally to the number of visitors. And this is not what you want. You want the number of visitors as they increase to have a steady, flat response time. So if you want to see if your varnish is working, you're gonna, you, you might want to use something like curl. Um, we can run curl-IK on your domain and you're going to want to be seeing um, that the age header, right now on the bottom of this slide, it says age is 697. If I keep running this command, I want that age to increase. If the age is zero, there's something wrong. Either a Drupal page cache is not enabled or something's wrong with the varnish configuration. Uh, and then, of course, it is so important to use logs, Luke. This is a force to help you understand what's going on with your website and why all of the errors are causing bad response time. Um, you can look at your PHP slow log, and this will help drill you down to the stack trace of what it exactly it is that caused this, uh, this slow query. Um, the Nginx error log, we have Nginx on Pantheon, so that was basically the example I have. I don't have a lot of Apache uh, logs anymore. But um, here's an example where you can see in bold, worker connections are not enough, and that means that uh, essentially you're going to need to have more resources to handle the amount of traffic considering the amount of uh, memory that is going to take to produce this particular response for that particular visitor. So you might need to have more workers. You might need to upgrade your website. Uh, MySQL slow log. Um, there's like a Easter egg hidden here. I don't know if you can find it. Uh, but this one is very interesting because it tells you the query time and the number of rows sent. And if you have like one row sent and you have a long query time, there might be a problem. You probably have an inefficient query. And um, going along to the watchdog, if you run, uh, if you go into your Drupal site, you can visit the watchdog page. Or if you're using Drush, I'm constantly going into my Drush aliases and running um, uh, Drush WS, which is Drush, it was just watchdog show. And I'll often have watchdog show dash dash count equals 200 to show me the last 200 watchdog error logs. And you can also drill down by the type of log. I do drush ws dash dash type equals php. And now I've got all my php errors in one list and I didn't have to go in, into the um, user interface at all. Here's an example of what you want to see. Every, all the errors have been taken out, the, the watchdog, you've looked at all the logs, you turn on the anonymous page caching. Okay, now we're talking. At the beginning, I kind of messed up on this load test because I didn't warm the caches. So warming the cache is where you have um, a bunch of simulated users, or you could just use wget, uh, basically request everything, spider your website, so it gets all the pages that you are likely to have visitors see prior to the launch of the website. And what you want to do is get the caches populated so that when you run a load test, it doesn't have to query the back end. It's already in Varnish. So once Varnish got, pop once Varnish got populated, um, obviously the response time went down, and it settled into about you know three seconds which is pretty decent for a website. And um, as the, the concurrent users uh, went up and up and up, you know, clearly the response time stayed flat. That's what you want to see. So please try to make websites that have this kind of a load test. Don't have them looking like this. This is not what you want to see. This is an example of a site that had problems with um, ca caching misconfigured, file not found errors, and um, maybe one other error. But it's really only three things that were quote unquote wrong with the site. And look at the kind of response times that you're getting. So I can assure you that most websites can be um, uh, optimized where they're not looking like this. So please have faith. I'm, I'm confident in all of your abilities to follow you know, launch check, 
look at the Drupal best practices, and you can level out these kinds of response times for any website just about. And, you know, interpreting results, looking at these load tests and, and giving these kinds of results to the business owners is very important because if you're going to want to make sure that the business owner doesn't come back complaining about performance issues, you at least have some kind of traceability about, you know, there is this problem with your product ordering page. We uncovered this when we were doing the load testing. The business impact is going to be you're going to have X less dollars you know, uh, per day because people cannot order that many products from your site because it simply cannot load that page enough times to satisfy the visitors it's receiving. And you can do this in, with data from Google Analytics. Um, so you can find out what the important pages are, what kind of conversion rates they're getting. And um, given the load test, you'll have an idea of the response time and you can start putting these numbers together and um, make sure that the website is optimized before launch um, and have that entire process approved by, by the, uh, the managers of the project. And uh, this is my zappy guy making the business case. <laughs> and that's it. It's a perfect launch every time. You know, the land of unicorns and rainbows and cake where we'd all like to be. It's, it's um, perhaps a, a slightly unattainable goal, but it's, it's a goal that we can try to approach. And so these are kind of some, some good steps that can, will help you and enable you to make that approach towards a good project um, that launches perfectly. And um, if you have any kinds of questions at all, you know, please come up to me and we'll talk about them. Or um, please, please feel free to, if you have a Pantheon site, you can open tickets and we can answer questions. We also have a Pantheon channel on Freenode. And um, that's about it. Thank you so much for letting me speak. <laughs>